Many years ago, before I was an actor, I trained as a car mechanic. I'm also a helicopter pilot, and I have a lifelong love affair with motorbikes. Is this it? This is it. You ready to go flying? Yeah, let's go. So this is my trip of a lifetime. Over five weeks, I will travel by all means of transport through Washington State and Oregon, taking in the breathtaking scenery to arrive in the Golden State of California and finish 1,200 miles later in the City of Angels, Los Angeles. My journey begins in the Pacific Northwest in the city of Seattle. Here, I'll sample the luxury of 1930s aviation. Oh, yes, now this is kitted out for me. Drive the car that changed the world. <laughs> and take to the footplate of a vintage Timberland steam engine. There's surely no better way to start a great adventure than by a float plane. Is this uh, fresh water or is it seawater? This is fresh water. I'm flying in a legendary de Havilland beaver. It's the workhorse of the Pacific Northwest and perhaps the best way to take in the glorious mountains and forests of Washington State and its biggest city, Seattle. Is that Seattle? There's Seattle right down there, yes, sir. Once a frontier town, Seattle boomed during the 1896 Klondike Gold Rush. It's still booming today and is the home to huge corporations like Microsoft and Amazon. It's about this time that you'd say, you do know there isn't a runway down there. Oh, there's a huge runway. It's 20 miles long. Yeah, right now. I'm coming into Seattle with a splash landing. I must say, it was a great experience. It was lovely. Planes have always been big business here, and they don't get much bigger than Boeing. For over a hundred years, Seattle has been home to what is now the world's largest aerospace company. Swapping my wings for wheels, I want to find out how did Boeing grow out of a frontier town? It all started here in 1916. This is the former shipyard building known as the Red Barn, and it was the first home of the Boeing Company. Oh, blimey. It's like a kit you buy and you put it together with glue, doesn't it? That's what it looks like. It's all wood. Amazing. The story goes that in 1915, William Boeing went for a joyride in an early aircraft and decided he could make one better. And the result is flying from the ceiling. That's a float plane, of course, yeah. I've just been on that. Well, not, not that one, but look at the floats on it. Look, they're all wood. Amazing, isn't it? Is that the beginning of Boeing? It absolutely is. That's our very first airplane, the B&W. Right. Right. So named, named for the initials of uh, Mr. Boeing mm -hmm. and his partner who helped him start the company, Conrad Westervelt. Right. But why a float plane? There weren't any airfields in those days, but there was huh? a lot of water, as you probably know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right, right. So that's why. Bill Boeing came to this area for timber, a timber baron. Yeah. His all of his wealth is in timber. Yeah. And yet he introduces some of the very first metal airplanes in the United States. And this is the Model 40. This is an air-cooled engine. And with that engine on this airplane, they saved almost 500 pounds of weight. Yes. And that could then be used to carry mail. How did it happen, the, the transition yeah. between mail and, and passengers? You see that door right there, and inside is a seat. It was to carry employees from one field to the next. Oh, was it? And then they realized that, well, we're not carrying an employee or mail. Maybe we can get somebody to pay to go for a ride. <laughs> now, there were about seven stops on the way right. between San Francisco and Chicago. So if they arrived at a field and there was a pile of mail that had to go on, the passengers would be left behind. No. Right. 
the mail had to go through. So <laughs> a year after they started operation, they really started thinking seriously about carrying passengers. So the airplane that followed this was a passenger airplane. And they realized that this is the future. I'm amazed that a timber merchant who made a small float plane would become the biggest aircraft maker on the planet. 50 years after it was founded, Boeing built the plane that changed the world. It's Monday, September 30th, 1968. Rollout day for the Boeing 747. Two and a half times bigger than anything that Boeing had built before. This is the actual prototype that was rolled out 50 years ago. God, blimey. That's stripped down to the bone. It's like the skeleton, isn't it? How on earth can a thing this size leave the ground? Who thought of it? Well, it was, looks like him, and he's still scratching his head about how he's going to get it off the ground. <laughs> well, come on. I'm going to get up and see where the pilot sits. It's hard to believe that half a century ago, this 747 took its first flight into history. On board were three people, two pilots and an engineer. Co-pilot Brian Weigel, now 93 years old, has come back to the cockpit to relive that amazing moment. Ah, here he is, the very man. Brian, <laughs> lovely to meet you. Glad to meet you. You fit better than I do. Well, yeah, for you... a big airplane, it doesn't have much room up front. I understand that uh, you were on the very first flight of this. Yes, this yes. actual Is this actual airplane? Yeah, I was here. You were there? Yeah. Brian, did you have a lot of trepidation when you're sitting on the end of the runway with the engines going? No. No. Knowing you got 400 tons to get into the air. I think we had butterflies when we were waiting. We were waiting for the weather. And finally, we decided yeah. to go. Designed and built in just 26 months, the largest civilian aircraft ever made hurtled down the runway. Now it lifts into the air. You must have felt a bit of relief for that? Oh, did yes. You think? Oh, I think so. Oh, yes. The more we went along, the more relaxed we got because so yeah. far everything yeah. was working. This airplane was a delight. It was tailored just right. It felt great to fly. Of course, it was a big machine, but it, it responded beautifully. It wasn't all perfect sailing, though, was it? No, we had one incident, and uh, one of the flap segments hung up. It got jammed a little. Yeah. So we decided that it was a good idea to go in and land. After a one-hour, 15-minute test flight, Brian and the crew safely brought the 747 back to Earth. If you think back, though, Brian, to that very, very first flight, what did it mean to you? I, I think you feel proud that you're part of this team that's putting this marvelous machine together. This is Brian and his chums leaving the aircraft. They've made history, but they're dressed like they've just left the office. The 747 opened the world to everyone. There was a period when Flying abroad meant 747s, and that was it. Yes, <laughs> yeah. It certainly did change the aviation world. We wouldn't have got halfway around the world without this little baby. Yeah, that's what did it. <laughs> I have discovered the birth of Boeing, and now I want to experience the glamour of those early days of aviation. I have come to the historic Flight Foundation to try my hand at the controls of a flying legend. Oh, now this is interesting. 1927. This unique collection represents the golden age of aviation from 1927 to 1957. 
30 years of innovation. Ah, look at that. What a lovely accolade for, for, the, for the Brits to have an actual Spitfire. What a stunning collection of old aircraft. I'm here to meet John Sessions, successful lawyer and aircraft enthusiast. Mr. Sessions, I do believe. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, John. So nice to see you, sir. Yeah, and you. I couldn't help noticing as I came round the corner yeah. that uh, you've got crutches. <clears throat> do you tell us why you need crutches? David, I had an accident a little less than a month ago, and uh, I will receive a prosthetic foot in a couple of weeks, and uh, that's where I am. Why? What happened? Were you flying at the yes, time? Yes, I had an accident on takeoff at the end of an air show. So, the aircraft, how did that come off? Shall we say it's a restoration project in waiting? <laughs> it's no laughing matter. Just weeks ago, John was seriously injured when his de Havilland Rapide crashed on takeoff. But what's wonderful about this aircraft collection is they're all airworthy, giving people a chance to taste the thrill of early aviation. I don't know what your first flight was, but I think most of us remember our first flight. It's, it's spiritual, it's inspirational, it's unbinding the bonds of Earth. Escape. Escape from planet Earth, as it were, yeah. and be the master of the skies is something that I never, ever lose when I fly. So we have a, a, an offer. Is it an offer I can't refuse? I, I would imagine so. We're, we're about to take up our DC-3 for a bit of a, a photo shoot. We wonder if you'd like to come along, maybe uh, get your hand on the controls and see how oh, it feels. Wonderful. The DC, yeah. do you know, that is a bit of an iconic aircraft because when I was a lad, just, uh, you know, I'm not going to say when, but <laughs> I had a DC-3 made out of aluminium and it was my favourite thing. I would be absolutely delighted for a trip in your aircraft. First flown in 1935, the Douglas DC-3 is credited with making air travel popular, affordable and profitable. This beauty was the best plane of its generation. We are joined by Eugene Vizzetti, a veteran DC-3 pilot. As we approach our DC-3, which was very instrumental in winning World War II and started as a passenger airplane and was quickly drafted into military service. And that's what this one was. This was actually a warbird. So but what would it have been, carrying troops? They were built as uh, paratroop drop airplanes. Oh, they were built as freighters. This one was specifically built to fly between India and interior China when the Japanese controlled the seaports. This old girl was built in 1944 and has a remarkable history. This rare film footage shows it flying over the Himalayas, supplying our Chinese allies in World War II. When this came back from the war, it was uh, modified in California for Johnson & Johnson, and this was their corporate airplane. 54 luxury. Yeah. 54, yeah, well, that's, that's all right. Hello? Oh, yes, now this is kitted out for me. Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away. In the 1930s, a DC-3 could take 15 hours to cross the United States with three stops to refuel. You know, she's surprisingly quiet. I was expecting to be, in a way, so we'll not be able to be heard. It's conversational at cruise power. It's a little louder when we're taking off. Yeah. The DC-3 was an overnight success. Just three years after its introduction, it was carrying over 90% of all airline passengers in the United States. Here she goes.
As we take off over the Boeing aircraft factory, it's worth reflecting that the Douglas DC-3 almost put Boeing out of business in the 1930s. Thousands were built and over 400 are still flying today, including this old beauty, which is 75 years old. Keep going, dear, keep going. <laughs> you may be a pensioner by now, but you're still flying. I was just wondering if I could poke my nose into the cockpit when Doug Burton, the co-pilot, popped in to see me. It's pretty good, huh? You ready to go fly? Yeah, all right. Alrighty. Yours truly can fly a glider and a helicopter, <laughs> so a DC-3 shouldn't be too hard to master. Oh, yes. Thank there you. he is. How are you doing, David? Very good. I'm surprised how smooth she is for an old girl. Well. Uh, it, today is a pretty good day for it. The wind out over the water is not bad here. When we get back down close to ground, it might not be as smooth. Right. Yeah. Now, one thing about the DC-3 is it's it's heavy on the controls. Do you have to put the put some feed some rudder in? Well, you... Yeah, if we do them nice and gentle like we're doing, we're okay. You're okay. Yeah. Yeah. But Grant, take the yoke and try to make a little turn to the left here. What a wonderful feeling this was. Oh, I never thought when I was a kid that I'd be doing this for real. And as long as you're making nice, gentle turns like this, yeah. it's pretty easy. Then to roll it out. But she is quite heavy, but as you said, she's quite responsive. Yeah. I mean, you got to put a bit in, haven't you? We're all right on course, are we? Oh, yeah, yeah. What a treat to fly the most glamorous plane in aviation history. It was lovely just pottering about in the sky. I could have stayed up there for hours. David, you had enough? No, I'm quite happy to uh, <laughs> fly around, man. <laughs> okay. But all good things come to an end, and I have to hand her back to Eugene. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It's just nice to get the controls of an aircraft. Yeah, OK, she's big and a bit heavy and a bit sluggish, but you soon, you'd soon get used to that. You wouldn't notice it. Flying is flying, really. It is, and you have to be a little more patient with this one. Of all the tasks the DC-3 has performed, none was more crucial than the role it played delivering troops for the liberation of Europe on D-Day. For John Sessions, his connection with this aircraft is deeply personal. His father was one of them. The DC-3 was the principal transport for the paratroopers. And my father was a member of the 101st Airborne. Charlie Company, 501st Paratroop Infantry Regiment, uh, jumped behind Utah Beach on D-Day, uh, survived. He was the jump master, so he was the last one out, and he was often at 500 feet before he left the airplane. Bloody hell. I, I can't help uh, but feel the emotion uh, when you say things like that. If we didn't have those brave, committed people, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you. The world would be completely different. This is Sergeant Guy Sessions. That's about uh, three days after the jump into France. In the fall of 1944, he was severely wounded. And uh, my mother, a Canadian, was his final nurse. Oh. And that picture just goes to show that we were all beautiful once. Yeah. No wonder he fell in love with her. I think we all would have done. It's back down to earth for me. What a great experience. I can quite understand the passion that drives people to save these marvelous machines, keeping them flying for all of us to remember the role they played in our history. Well, what a lovely experience, eh? 
There's something very romantic about a piston-engined aircraft, and uh, it was great. Thank you, old girl. Got us back safe and sound. It's time to leave Seattle. I'm on a journey down the west coast of America, discovering stories behind extraordinary machines. But first, I have to find my wheels. Got no idea what sort of car it is, but all will be revealed, I'm sure. Oh, my good grief, Penfold. Look at that, eh? They don't come much smoother than that. I love that period of car. Yes. Yes. Leave me to it, my son. I think I'll take this home. Oh, could you imagine, eh? Driving down Berwick Street in this. Yes. What we are in is a 1952 Packard. To see cars like this as very young lads, God, it made you think the Americans used to live in heaven and we were like on the other side. I did promise I'd look after it if I took it home, but they said, no, drive it to where it lives. My lovely Packard lives 30 miles south of Seattle in Tacoma. I've come to meet Nancy LeMay, the widow of Harold LeMay, who made his fortune in waste disposal and amassed one of the largest private collections of automobiles in the world. <laughs> Thank you, Sir Nancy. David. It's Thank so you. nice to have you here. So, where's the house? It's, it's right back there. That's the house? Yes. And all of this? Is the, is the collection? Right. Harold LeMay referred to his home as a house with a 300-car garage. Can't wait to take a peek inside. What I really got to remember is how to turn all the lights on. Look at it. How on earth did one man collect this? This is amazing. The age of this, what is it, 1904? Never heard of it, an Orient buckboard. The place is absolutely stuffed chocker full of everything, isn't oh, it? Oh, I know. I know. I can't even think of anything he didn't collect. And what's the history of this? It says to Nancy with love, Harold. Well, this is one of the first automatic dishwashers. No. <laughs> That's brilliant. Gosh, let loose in here for a while, eh? Got to be some things I wouldn't mind. We'll have to, uh, somebody will have to uh, check our pockets when we leave. Or check mine. Oh, she's gone. Where is she? That Dolly Parton over there. Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> John Wayne, like the hell I am. Right. Yeah. What a, an amazing character Harold was, wasn't he? Certainly was an adventure. Yes, <laughs> I bet. That adventure began back in 1963 when Nancy married Harold. And it was the start of 30 years of passionate collecting. What job did he do? Uh, he owned garbage companies. Well, there's, so, there was, there's money in rubbish, is that it? <laughs> That's exactly right. Good Lord. He loved the history. He loved the find, where you go to get them. So it was the passion of collecting, it no, seems. No, no. It was more saving, saving history. He used to say, I don't smoke and I don't drink. Yeah. I collect cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you think this is amazing, you ain't seen nothing yet. Harold ran out of space at home, so he bought more properties for storage the largest and entire school and grounds. His son, Doug, is continuing the grand tour. Good Lord, look at it, it's never ending. We have cars from 1886 to 2013. Harold lived on to 81, passing away in 2000. 
By then, the collection was estimated at over 3,000 vehicles. Now, look at this. Now, what is this, and what's the date? Well, this, is, this, is, this is the first uh, patented automobile, which was an uh, 1886 Benz. That's the car I want to have a look at, that one there. And that one reminds me of that film, The Great Gatsby. Yeah, that's that era. It's the 36 Auburn. God, it's so ostentatious, isn't it? Yeah. So what, what is that engine? That is a what, six, eight, ten in line? Eight. And it's, look at the color of it, look. Yeah. And what would she do if you had it flat out, do you reckon? Oh, this is fast as you wanted to hold on to the steering wheel. Yeah. Because some of them are just beautiful. Well, they are. It's like the, you know, the gas cap here. You know, that's, that's where they put the gas cap. Oh, isn't that beautiful? So they, they hid it in the design it's of the car. Outrageous. Do you know why he had this passion, this obsession to collect cars? I don't, really. No? You're not going to buy any more cars, are you? I uh, buy them all the time, yeah. God, dear. You're incorrigible. You're worse than your father. Yeah, I, well, <laughs> no, he trained me. Yeah, he did. Among the thousands of cars that Harold saved, he had a particular fondness for the Ford Model T. And is this a Model T? This is a Model T. Basically the same engine you got today. And the Model T was the one that really started the whole revolution well, of the motor industry, wasn't it? He did an awful lot building so many of them so cheap. Yeah. A working man could buy a Model T. But it down to the untrained ear, very sweet. Oh, yeah. So you want to learn how to drive a Model T? I wouldn't mind the challenge, I okay. must tell well, you. there's really not too much challenge to it. You Just reckon? forget everything you know about driving cars except how to turn the steering <laughs> wheel. <laughs> One of the most important cars ever made, the Model T Ford was mass-produced and affordable for working people. This one, named Nancy after his wife, is one of the first cars that Harold acquired. I'm going to take her for a spin. You got three pedals. The left pedal is high and low. In the middle is neutral. Yeah, all right. Okay. The right. right pedal is a brake. Yeah. All through the starting. Okay. Is he ready? Yeah. Okay, right. so, so basically, we're ready to go. So that's the, this is the throttle. Yeah. Now, to go, yeah. you give it a little bit of throttle, and you step on that pedal, the left pedal. There you go. So then you go. just push it all the way to the floor. It's not going to go much faster. She's plenty fast enough for me, thank you. I am driving a piece of history, after all. Not like anything you've ever driven before. No! I don't want it to run away with me. Oh, you don't have to give it so much throttle. Yeah. About, about a thousand miles, you'll be doing good. Between 1908 and 1927, the Ford Company built 15 million of these bone shakers, and it put the whole world on wheels. Quite a sharp turn. It's like driving a bloody bus. Well, you could imagine, though, that when this was first on the road and you were the fella that had one, and God, the yeah. bee's knees, eh? Yeah. God. She would go quite fast if you, if you let her. Yep. Yeah. I'm none the wiser why Harold LeMay was so obsessed with collecting cars. <laughs> but I'm glad that he did. You have to admire a man who has saved so much for us to enjoy today. God, dear. <laughs> what an experience. Thank you, Doug. You did an excellent job. Bless you. And come back and teach our class now. I will. It definitely was an experience. <laughs> uh, one that I don't think I shall enjoy 
encountering again. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. Great. I'm now going to see if I can stagger off to my car now. Oh, <laughs> I'm going back to power steering. I'm travelling south into the foothills of Mount Rainier. Long before plane makers, coffee bars and global tech companies dominated the Pacific Northwest, the wealth in this region came from trains and trees. I've come to a museum which preserves an old timber camp and the unique steam engines that helped make timber king. I love trains, but I'm about to meet a man who is actually living his boyhood dream. I think I know that sound. Good grief, Tempo. Well, I was going to say good morning, but um, I don't know what to say. And you are Rowdy. I am Rowdy, and you must be David. That's it, yeah. So what is it then, this? This was a Model T one-ton truck that was built to haul one log to a mill. And whoever was the man that was driving it with one log on it, because the logs then were huge, was a much braver man than me. <laughs> <laughs> I have for you, right here, the designated uniform that we are going to need to be able to go into the railroad section of this museum. I see. Never told me about this. Engine driver, Mark One. Rowdy looks after the most comprehensive collection of steam-powered logging trains in North America. These turn-of-the-century timber trains pushed steam technology to the limit. This engine, built in 1929, this is known as the Climax. Why did anybody decide to call it the Climax? You have me on that. <laughs> I rest my case. I'm not going to discuss it any further, but it's very interesting that a steam engine is called the climax. Let's just put it this way. This yeah. locomotive, when it's running, it vibrates and bounces a lot. Well, that probably answers the question then. Yes, good, well done, Rowdy. You tactfully got out of that. Rowdy has a treat in store for me. It has been my childhood dream to drive a train. I can't miss the chance to take a ride on this classic diesel engine. This is a real beast, isn't it? It is a monstrous beast. This diesel is very iconic. It is. the American railroad system. It, it is. This is Josh Kaibo. Hello, Josh. He is How our diesel nice, man. Sir? We've got 1,700 horsepower of American iron. Would you like to take a look at it? <laughs> 1,700 of American horsepower. That's uh, right. I like it, sir. Well, let's take a look at it. Yeah, come on. Let's get this thing rolling. It's these uh, overalls uh, that are a bit skin tight here. Would you like to blow the horn, David? That sounds a bit rude. <laughs> Terribly butch, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I've never been in uh, one of these monsters. But the thing about this, you, you, you feel as though you know them because they're so iconic. Yeah, I was just looking forward. It's quite exciting, really. Here we go. I've got no steering wheel here, and I have no brakes on my side. So if anything happens, I can't. Oh, it's better out than in, isn't it? Eh? Oh. What would be your top speed? Do you dare take it? It's our maximum speed on this railroad, 15 miles an hour. 15. Well, not very fast. How old is this track then, Josh? It's well over 100 years old at this point. This vintage diesel locomotive hauled the freight trains that built America in the post-war years. 
She was built for the Northern Pacific Railroad, known as the Main Street of the Northwest, linking Seattle to the east coast of America. She was built for the Northern Pacific 1956, and she was on transcontinental freight trains, you know, girl up over mountain passes, scoot across the prairie. She'd be pulling tons and tons of freight. It's kind of nice to be able to take the old gal out and, you know, put her through its paces and make sure she's still earning her keep. Why do you call this mechanical machine a she? All the old boys, they'd spend so much time working on machines, they didn't have time for a girlfriend or a wife, so you end up married to the thing, might as well be your wife. <laughs> That's the best explanation I've ever heard. I have arrived at L a small town that's big on trains. David, I hope you enjoyed your ride. I certainly did. A pleasure meeting you. Well done, sir. Well, that was a thrill, and there's more to come. Did you have fun? Very interesting. Lovely. Well, now yep. we are going to go and get on to, my opinion, what a real engine is. Oh, right. What we have here is we have a Willamette. A what? A Willamette geared locomotive. It is one of six left in existence, and it's the only one that operates. What was the attraction of these old Long machines? story short, the second highway crossing up the line here, that's my uncle's place. And we'd visit in the summertime, and every day that we were here, six times a day, little Rowdy would run out there and wave at the train as it would go by. No. And it became a yearly tradition to ride it, and I'm turning 30 next month. I've been doing it for 17 years. I literally grew up with them. Rowdy's geared loco is not everybody's cup of tea, but I love them. Just look at the cogs on that. Yeah, this is the bit that fascinates me. This is what you were talking about. Yes, this engine is geared three to one. So what that means is the engine set is spinning over three times to every one time that the wheel spins over. So that gives this locomotive a huge volume of torque at very slow speeds. So all of this uh, gearing along here that looks very complicated is in fact what was designed to give it the torque exactly. that it needs to pull all the logs. So I've got to wear this because I'm an engine driver now, am I? Mm-hmm. How's that? Right. I'll get up here. Stand by. Chief Engineer coming aboard. OK, here we go. Turn of the century timber barons needed trains with the power to haul logs over rough ground. The geared engine was born. As you see, it doesn't go very fast, but I am pulling this entire train with very little effort. This engine could pull probably another three or four cars that we have back there easily. The gear system transfers the engine's power to every wheel. She may not be the fastest train on the track, but she's one of the strongest. I imagine she must have been quite a sight for five-year-old Rowdy. That crossing right there, that's where I grew up. That's right where I used to watch these six times a day. I need red man to protect me, right? Good grief, Enfold. It's hot and noisy in here. This is a steam train, but it's not coal-fired. Timber trains were oil burners because coal cinders caused forest fires, a hazard then as now. The highlight of my Timberland journey is the crossing over the Nisqually River. It's fed by glaciers high up on the slopes of Mount Rainier, which is hidden today by clouds. Where's the gauge? that tells us how much water we have That's throughout. what these two glasses right here, that tells us both where the water is at. Hope we've got plenty of water there, have we? 
We got plenty of water. They just lost the wood. Ah. Built in the 20s, this engine spent its working life hauling timber before she was sold for scrap in 1962. Rowdy knows her every nut and bolt after spending two years helping to restore her to her former glory. There's plenty of life in the old girl. She now easily hauls tourists instead of timber, giving them a real taste of local history. Okay, Stephen, that's all. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome, thank you. Quiet chap, Steve. Didn't even know he was there. Down we go. It's been a sort of boyhood dream to drive the real deal. Thanks a lot. It was my boyhood dream. Yeah? And now I'm doing it. And you're still doing it. I still do it every day. Good for you. I have loved every minute in the Pacific Northwest. Now I'm heading south. On the way, I will fly into the heart of a volcano, try my hand at drag racing, and take to the air in the legendary P-51 Mustang. Lovely jubbly. 